This summer, our York and Brock regions have been regularly hosting barbecues on campus to show God's love to students and to invite them into relationship with our church family. As a result, we've gotten connected with around 30 new people over the last month. And some of these people have even started to explore Christianity and Jesus by coming regularly to huddles and gatherings. Now, as we move into the latter half of the summer, it's important to continue to ask how our simple churches can show God's love to our campuses this summer. encouraging story. Thank you so much, Evan, for just sharing that. It's so encouraging to hear what's happening at York and Brock with your bi-weekly barbecues. You guys are just doing a tremendous job showing up week after week, serving your campuses faithfully, and you're inviting people into um, huddle and gathering, and so that's so encouraging to see. So keep it up, guys. You're doing awesome. My name is Tara. If we haven't met yet, I serve on our senior leadership team here at Lyft Church, and I have three announcements for us today. So the first one is Daily Devos. We are in our next series of Daily Devos starting Sunday, July 3rd. So if you haven't seen it, here it is. We are going to be going through Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Mark over the course of the summer and into September. And so this is a great way to just spend time in scripture with your simple church family, with your housemates, and with other people in our church family um, as we just journey towards Jesus together. Um, so definitely get your copy today. You can find them by going to liftchurch.ca slash books and order them on Amazon from there, or you can also follow along on engage.liftchurch.ca. Okay, so in conjunction to that, we are also doing 10 weeks of prayer this year. So over the course of the summer, as we get ready for Welcome Week this fall and the opportunity to be on our campuses in full force, we are going to be spending time praying every day so that the Holy Spirit would prepare our hearts as we get ready to welcome people into our church family and to share the gospel on our campuses this fall. So don't leave your gathering today without a poster. Make sure you take one home with you, hang it on your fridge. You can be praying with those you live with, those in your Simple Church family, and you can also join the prayer room every day at 8 a.m. from now until Welcome Week. So that starts on July 4th. Make sure uh, you grab a calendar today. My third announcement for you is our summer Serve Our City event. So on Saturday, July 9th at 11 a.m., we're going to be going downtown Hamilton to serve the vulnerable population um, in the downtown core. We're going to be handing out water and lemonade and just meeting people where they are at because that's something that Jesus commands us to do in Matthew 25. So if you're interested in serving the downtown um, population and you've never been able to um, join our mobile ministries for that before, I'd encourage you to sign up for that, especially if you're um, from a different campus maybe that's outside of Hamilton and you've been wanting to do that in your own city. This is a great opportunity for you to come and to learn and then to take that learning home with you to your campus and your city and begin something similar there yourself. So that's Saturday, July 9th at 11 a.m. Put that in your calendar and you can sign up on engage.liftchurch.ca. All right, last thing on Sunday, August 28th, we have Simple Church Rally. So I've got it in my calendar. I'll be there and I look forward to seeing you there too. Have a great Sunday, guys. I'm going to pass it off to Robin and your Simple Church Regional Directors for the rest of gatherings. Hey, church. Here are some ways that you can give in your Simple Church families. You can give online at liftchurch.ca slash give. You can text give the amount and your Simple Church region to 1-844-992-1420. For example, that could be give 50 Waterloo. You can also set up automatic bank withdrawals by going to engage.liftchurch.ca and downloading the automatic giving form from Discipleship Resources. Be sure to select your Simple Church region from the drop-down menu when you're setting up your giving. Practicing radical generosity together by giving on a monthly or weekly basis allows us to consistently give of our treasures. Thanks for helping us see more people be made fully alive in the hope of Jesus on university and college campuses. 
All right. Good afternoon, church. I am excited to get into the final, uh, probably pretty sure it's the final uh, session of the Peter Pan and the gospel series, talking about how the gospel calls us to grow up. And in this final uh, teaching, I want to explore the converse, a conversation around what it means to be people that are servants. Uh, perhaps one of the most significant ways that we could be called to grow up is to quite honestly, just give our lives to serve other people. One of the ways that best exemplifies spiritual maturity is when we live lives that aren't for our benefit, but are for the benefit of others. That is perhaps the most quintessential way we can take responsibility for other people is by serving them, by deferring to them, by putting their needs ahead of ours. And I want to explain why that is such a, necess a necessary component of the gospel. And so we're going to be in Matthew 20, 20 to 28 today, and uh, I'm going to read uh, the passage in just a minute. But before we read it, let's pray. It's just as you're uh, flipping to, to Matthew 20. Lord, we thank you for this uh, incredibly important passage that changes the way we think about leadership, the way we think about being a Christ follower. And Lord, I pray that today uh, our time in your word would mold us and shape us. Amen. So we're reading in Matthew 20 today. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. Uh, she knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? Jesus asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and on and my left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those who have been, been prepared by my father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come in to, to come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when we're thinking about the trajectory of our lives, we can come to uh, the Lord, we can come to faith, we can come to a relationship with Jesus with lots of assumptions and assumptions about what Jesus is going to do for us, assumptions about uh, what life following Jesus is going to be like, assumptions about what uh, life in the church is going to be like, assumptions about uh, what our future, our spouse, our families, our children, our jobs, our financial situation. We can come with all kinds of assumptions and even expectations of Jesus. And that's what was happening in this passage. The, uh, the mother of two of Jesus' disciples comes to Jesus and basically is sort of politically uh, maneuvering so that they have influence in Jesus' future kingdom. But to really understand what's going on in this context, we need to better assess uh, what exactly, what, what, where that request was coming from. You see... The Jewish people, Jesus was Jewish, and the, the Jewish people had been subjugated by the Romans and before the Romans, a, a sequence of other empires for, for several hundred years. In fact, there was a gap between the end of the Old Testament, that's the part of the Bible before Jesus, and the beginning of the New Testament of about 400 years. And in those 400 years, there was a whole sequence of rebellions and revolts and uh, attempts by the Jewish people to establish their own independent nation state. Uh, or their own independent uh, possession of land. And they were never successful in doing that. And at this point in time, the Romans had subjugated the Jewish people, and they were extremely resentful of that. Now, those revolts were usually led by what people thought were Messiah figures, uh, saviors that had come to establish a kingdom. And the expectation, even as this is trending towards the end of Jesus' ministry, was still that Jesus was going to build an earthly kingdom, that he was going to establish a, uh, a kingdom on this world that would look 
like uh, the overthrowing of the Romans. And so the, the mother of these two disciples is trying to ensure that in the establishing of this new kingdom, uh, this new earthly kingdom, uh, that their disciple, her sons would have influence. And it's important to understand that this was not just a, a spiritual kingdom. We talk about the kingdom of God all the time. They really didn't think about it like that. They thought of it as like an earthly kingdom. Now, it would have embodied the kingdom of God to a degree, but they, they really saw it as like Jesus literally sitting on a throne or something like that. You know, one of the things that we have to stop and ask ourselves when we come to Jesus is, are our expectations of Jesus aligned with Jesus' intentions for our lives? You see, what was happening here was that they expected Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom, but Jesus had no interest in establishing that kind of kingdom. He was bringing the kingdom of heaven, an entirely different paradigm a kingdom uh, built not on military might and political influence, a kingdom built on self-sacrificial love, as evidenced in his death, which meant that any assumption that they came to that was rooted in a building of an earthly kingdom was never going to align with Jesus' intentions. And so when we come to Jesus asking the question like, what's the future? What's my life going to look like? Where am I going? What's my influence? How do I live? So often we come to Jesus with assumptions that are derived from our culture or assumptions that are derived from the way we were raised or assumptions that are derived from our spheres of influence rather than Jesus' heart, Jesus' intention, Jesus' purpose. And so what we need to do is when we, when we come to Jesus and ask Jesus really like big questions, like how ought I to live? Like, how do I, how do I live in relationship with people? How do I conduct my life? How do I choose my future? We need to stop and, and examine our hearts and go, where are my assumptions coming from? You see, it's really hard to hear what Jesus is saying to us, to, to hear what Jesus' call is on our lives, to live the way Jesus has called us, if our assumptions bias us to never hear what Jesus is saying. We may have very deep longings in life, like really passionate longings. We may deeply yearn for something. It could be anything. We could be absolutely convinced that like this is a deep passion. Like they really had a deep yearning to see the kingdom of uh, God established and the Romans overthrow Like it was genuine, but here's the problem with genuine yearnings. They can be based on false assumptions. So we could passionately desire something that is actually false. And that's exactly what was happening here. Their entire paradigm of leadership, the entire paradigm of following Jesus was based on the false assumption that he was going to bring a kingdom that would look like an earthly kingdom. And so we need to stop really carefully when we're asking the question, what does it look like to follow Jesus and go back to Jesus' life and say, okay, my assumptions, my expectations, my, uh, my, even my longings need to be put down and I need to just allow Jesus' life and ministry and attitude and, and, and way of being start to influence my expectations for the future. Similarly, we need to stop and ask ourselves when we come to Jesus, what do I really want? Like, what do I really deep down want? I think, you know, most of us look at this text and say, ah, you know, look at, look how silly those, those disciples were. They were, they were trying to, 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 to vie for influence in the kingdom. And how silly is that? Jesus wasn't building an earthly kingdom. Ah, come on. They should have, they should have known better. But I think that that's a little bit, uh, prideful of us because if we really stop and examine our hearts, how many of us have a, an assumption or an expectation of what God is going to do in our lives that is at the core rooted in selfish interest? Many of us are not that interested if we're honest. Like maybe we wouldn't admit this out loud. Maybe we would never admit this to a single living soul. But when we, when we do a, a deep analysis of our hearts— Many of us are not that interested in what we can do 
to serve the Lord, but rather what the Lord can do to give us what we want. So we come to the Lord, as the disciples did, with selfish expectation. We even do this in like in church, in church serving roles. We enter into leadership opportunities in the church with the maybe not quite fully verbalized, but uh, if we're honest, we're doing it to pad our resume. Oh, I had this leadership role. I exerted this level of influence. Well, Christian leadership can never come from a place of selfish interest. And maybe a good way to test this is what if, a good way to test our hearts is to say, what if there was absolutely no personal benefit that was derived from me serving Jesus? We all have some personal benefit. We get community, we get friendships, we uh, maybe get the, the satisfaction of doing things. And that's good. That's not bad that there is some, some benefit. But what if there wasn't any benefit? What if the call to following Jesus meant that we, we, we had to give our lives? What if it meant that we had to pay a price? What if it meant that we had to sacrifice? What if it meant that we had to give up? Like, would we still follow Jesus? Or is our following of Jesus conditional or based on it benefiting us? That's what the disciples were expecting of Jesus. They were basically saying, Jesus, we'll, we'll follow you so long as the end outcome is in our interest. You know, as the church continues to become pushed to the margins of society and uh, misrepresented and uh, viewed with skepticism or even in cases downright hatred, there will be fewer and fewer reasons for us to seek the benefits of becoming a Christian, at least socially. But will we still follow Christ faithfully? Will we still follow Christ faithfully if our faith is illegal? Will we still follow Christ faithfully if our friends forsake Christ? Will we still follow Christ faithfully if our, uh, if it costs us financially or costs us in our careers? Like, like, where's the line that we're drawing in our minds of like, I'll, I'll serve you, Jesus, but you know, the cost benefit needs to work out in my favor. You see, the call to follow Christ, as we're going to see in a moment, is a call to, to really give our lives. What we receive is the gift of salvation, but what we give is all of our lives. And that's why Jesus says in verse 22, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? It's so easy to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm just so grateful that, that, uh, that you love me, that you've made my life better. But what I have seen so many times is that people are eager to, to confess Christ when, when a uh, relationship with Jesus seems to solve a particular problem in their lives. Maybe even a, a deep loneliness. But make no mistake, there is a cost to following Jesus. A very real cost. In fact, Jesus, uh, in, in his teaching with his disciples, it tells him, like, if you're going to follow me, you got to pick up your cross. you got to take your cross. The cross was a, an execution device. It was a symbol of, of, of death. You have to take that on in order to follow me. That's the price. Jesus isn't looking for us to, to come to him and say, thank you so much for making my life better. I, I'm, I'm now going to follow you for a few minutes while you continue to make my life better. Jesus is looking for us to yield all of our lives to him. This is kind of a funny thing because, you know, part of me would just love to teach a, a cheap version of Christianity that says, come to Jesus, he's going to make your life better and everything will be all right. But that's not true, for one. It's deceitful for a second because the, the reality is that coming to Jesus requires, yes, the free gift of grace, yes, the free gift of salvation, but it requires that we also count the cost of following him and that we count the cost of confessing him as Lord. And what Jesus is, is trying to help the disciples see here is that what they're doing is they're seeing the potential upside without counting the cost of following him. Many in the room at the time would end up actually dying for their faith.
Have you counted the cost of following Jesus? Like, where, where have you me- mentally drawn the line? Like, I'll follow Jesus so long as he doesn't ask me to give up a relationship. I'll ask, I'll follow Jesus so long as uh, he doesn't ask me to do anything difficult or painful. I'll follow Jesus so long as I, I can live the life of my, uh, my childhood over again. I'll follow Jesus. Like, like, where's the mental line for you? We all have one. And what Jesus is calling here is he's saying, you don't know what you're asking. Like you're, you're asking for is influence in my kingdom, but influence in my kingdom is going to come at the cost of becoming a servant. Something very interesting happens here. He says, the 10 disciples, so the other 10 that were around, they became indignant. They were uh, jealous or like, come on, like you guys are seriously politically maneuvering here. And so he says in verse 25, Jesus called them over and said, you know that the Gentiles lorded over them and those in positions act as tyrants over them. So, so what Jesus does here is he says, you know, the Gentiles. So what he's basically saying here is, you know, those leaders that you really hate, let's think about their style of leadership for a second. So he takes the the Gentile leaders, that is the the Roman leaders functionally, and highlights that they're tyrants and overlords. And you can just imagine the disciples are like, yeah, we know they're, they're tyrannical, they're overlords, we want nothing to do with them. And what Jesus is is really doing here is he's saying, actually, by the way, this this request is in the same vein as their leadership. He's, He's basically saying, if you are coming to me vying for positions of power, vying for personal benefit, then you're of the same corrupted order as the leaders that you're seeking to overthrow. This is one of the brilliant and beautiful things about following Jesus is that Christianity identifies that all of us equally are sinners, meaning all of us have the propensity to act in a way that is selfish and offensive to God. We do what we want. We live how we want. We act how we want. And Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to vie for power, you're going to end up essentially the same as those Gentile rulers. You're not any better than them. And so what we need to do is we need to stop and and carefully assess the condition of our hearts when we're following Jesus, when we're thinking about following Jesus and go, okay, what, what really is my motivation here? What am I really after? We're not nearly as altruistic as I think we wish we were. All of us have selfish interests. And we need to be cautious and careful and aware of of where those selfish interests are influencing how we see our role in the church. We see this play out all the time, right? Like like key church leaders that uh, that you know don't want to give up their their programs or their ministry styles in order to serve the rest of the church because it's become a little kingdom unto itself. Like this this is just normal. This happens. So part of following Jesus is authentically is learning to to actually have the self-awareness to to say, I actually have a propensity towards selfishness. I could become a tyrant and an overlord. I could act in a way that is detrimental to other people. Therefore, I come to you, Jesus, humbly, not arrogantly seeking position. And this is where Jesus starts to say, okay, here's, here's the better way. Verse 26, he says, it must not be like that among you, right? So, so don't be like the Gentiles. Now, if they didn't have a risk of becoming like the Gentiles, he wouldn't have had to say it. So he's clearly saying, look, you're on the road to becoming the same as the leaders that you're trying to overthrow. It's almost like this interesting, like animal farm, if you've read animal uh, farm-esque moment. He says, on the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Now, this is quite interesting. He's saying, look, if you, if you want to follow me, if you want to be uh, a person that is, uh, that is significant in the kingdom of God, it starts by becoming a slave, 
a servant. Now, notice something really interesting that Jesus does here. He doesn't say, whoever wants to be first among you must do acts of service. He doesn't say, uh, whoever wants to be first among you must... uh, and then give this prescriptive behavior modification. The, the, the verb he uses here is the verb to be. He says we must be a slave, meaning that there is a much deeper transformation that needs to occur in our souls than just doing acts of service. We need to have an identity overhaul, an identity transformation to become servants. You see, the kingdom of God that Jesus was actually bringing is is upside down because it's not built on selfish ambition, which we are all prone to. It's not based on self-interest. It's not based on influence. It's based on becoming people that are other-centered. Becoming people that are slaves. To be a Christian is not to do acts of service. It is to be a, a slave, a servant. Now, this is actually really good news because you might like, why is it good news that the call to following Jesus requires me to be a slave? Well, it's good news because we're all going to be slaves of something. In Romans 6, Paul talks about this very important principle that we are enslaved to the things we obey, all of us. Whatever we are doing in our lives uh, that we're committed to, we end up enslaved to. So the disciples, they were enslaved. They were following Jesus out of selfish ambition to seek positions of influence and had therefore become enslaved to it. That's why it's good news, because what actually happens when we become slaves to Christ and and give of our interests to instead serve his interests and other people, every other follower of Jesus is living in a way that is other centered meaning the family of God, the community of faith, is a place that is selfless and other-centered. That sounds like a pretty wonderful place. You know, no one's, no one's uh, acting selfishly. Everybody's caring for every other person's interests. I think this is perhaps why the Acts 2 church, uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit, immediately becomes this place. This is like the beginning of the church, right, when it was founded, where people shared their resources, They shared their stuff. They shared their homes. They gathered together. Why? Well, because people that have experienced the transformation of Christ will inherently become selfless and other-centered. Now, this call to become a servant, to be a servant, to have an identity overhaul, is why we don't talk and use the word volunteer in our church, maybe you've noticed that we never use the word volunteer, and that's that's really intentional. Because volunteering is a is like a task, like we do the task of volunteering. But our call in church life is not to do the tasks of volunteering, but to become people who serve, to become servants. We do not serve each other, we do not serve in church because it is something good to do. We serve because we are people who uh, have adopted the identity of a servant. As we become servants, serving other people becomes a natural and inevitable extension of who we are. Serving is a way of life. This is why there is an expectation that every person in our church serve. From the newest member to the person that's been around the longest, from the least important to the most important, every person is served because we're calling every person to adopt the identity of a servant. To follow Jesus is to be a servant, which means every family, every member needs to serve. Now, one way we can identify this is that uh, when, when we're operating from a task mindset on serving versus an identity mindset, is that Serving can often become like a task done in addition to the rest of our life, right? So we we try to uh, bolt serving on, like, okay, I got to do my serving responsibility, my serving hours. I I joined a team, and therefore I'm fulfilling the responsibility of of serving. You know, I got to give my serving hours or participate in community service projects in an effort to please Jesus. But this is really important. Jesus isn't looking for us to do tasks in order for us to please him. He's looking for us to have an identity transformation of becoming servants. 
Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. We need to be careful that we don't compartmentalize serving into part of our life. The identity of a servant embodies us 24-7. Every moment of every day, we are called to live into the posture and identity of a servant. Perhaps one of the most important characteristics of any Christian leader is whether or not they serve faithfully the people that God has placed them in. Now, often when we teach this, there's like kind of a response, like a visceral response, like, okay, this is like really extreme. And maybe it's like, maybe it's too extreme for us to even do it, right? Like this is just too, too much, but too extreme by, by what standard? Like, how do we know that this is too extreme? Like it's too extreme for us to call people to serve 24 seven, to become servants. When we respond to an idea such as the one I'm laying out today, that we are called to be servants viscerally, we need to stop and ask the question, how have I calibrated my measurement of this idea? When we're evaluating whether or not an idea is biblical or a good idea or a faithful idea, it's important that we are properly calibrated. So a tool in order for it to measure correctly whether it's the speed on your car, for example, your your car is driving down the road and it's measuring the the speed, the wheel speed sensor needs to be properly calibrated to the size of the wheel, to the, the conditions of the environment it finds itself in to correctly measure the speed. If the sensor is not calibrated, it may tell you that you're driving at 50 kilometers an hour when you're actually driving at 100. And therefore we would come to false conclusions, like I'm not speeding when in fact, you are speeding. Calibration is really, really important. And so Jesus gives us actually a way to calibrate this call to become servants. He gives us the calibration metric. So if we want to calibrate for, is my my conception of the Christian call to serving properly calibrated? He gives us the, the means to calibrate it. In verse 28, he says, just as The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, those words there, just as, what Jesus is saying here is that the call I am giving you to serve, I am going to embody myself. So if you want to know what the standard is, just just look at me. Just look at Jesus. Jesus here, point here, is that the standard for Christian life, the calibration for Christian life, is to be measured against Jesus' life, not our cultural norms, expectations, upbringings, and so forth. As I said at the very beginning of the message, we are conditioned, raised with all kinds of assumptions about what normal Christian living looks like. And it's so important that we go back to the word, back to the Bible, back to the scriptures to say, okay, what does Christian living look like? And Jesus here is very clearly saying that Christian living is rooted in the adopting and the transforming power of becoming servants. So I'll give you an example of how this plays out in our church. We've taken this quite seriously for for many, many years. It's been an important passage. And it's why we see the future of church planting, the future of all church leadership, as uh, held by those who have full-time jobs. Like the normal mode of church leadership shouldn't be people that are paid, uh, but people who are just giving of their lives to serve the kingdom because we're called to become servants. That's why all of our campus directors have jobs, like they work. And when uh, your regional director calls us into a life of service, they can do it credibly because they have given their lives to service. We genuinely believe that every Christian can live a life that is fruitful in the serving of other people by becoming servants, by giving their whole lives to the kingdom of Jesus. That's our call. And you might say, well, that's impossible. I could never do that. And you know what the truth is? We can't. We can't live this way. 
the disciples could not live up to the standard that Jesus had set. And in fact, when push came to shove, the disciples ended up running from this idea. But what happened is that eventually those disciples would give their lives to the gospel rather than running out in fear and selfish interest. But that was made possible not because they worked at it, not because they were really uh, faithful and consistent, but because they invited the Holy Spirit to, uh, to, to, into their lives. So Jesus says, I'm going to give your life. He then gives his life. I'm sorry. Jesus says, I'm going to give my life for you. He then gives his life, is raised from the dead, ascends to the Father, and sends the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on those disciples, when they open themselves up and receive the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, they are transformed supernaturally from people who were operating in selfish interest to people who now are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in them. We cannot receive the call to become faithful to follow Jesus by becoming servants just by trying harder. It's actually about humbly coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, I, I need your help. Holy Spirit, like only you can do this work in me. So I open my life, my heart, my time, my space, my emotions up to that transformation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the, the writers that has best articulated these themes. And I would encourage you, if you haven't, to read his work, The Cost of Discipleship. It is uh, perhaps one of the most important books of the 20th century on following Jesus. It's short, very easy to read. And he says this, as we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give our lives over to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. The call to follow Jesus is a call to give our lives at the feet of Jesus, saying, Jesus, I no longer live for myself. I live for your benefit. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we just thank you uh, for this word. We thank you that you call us to be servants by you first being the first and great servant, the one who gave his life for us. And Jesus, thank you that although that is impossible in our ability, by your grace, we can receive the gift of life with you. And Lord, I pray for those in, uh, that are listening today that have not yielded to you, that have not said, Jesus, you are now my Lord. God, that you would give them the, the supernatural ability to receive you as their God, to say yes to you, to, to become a servant of Christ. Lord, Lord, for those that have received you as Lord, I pray that, that we as a people would, would be people that are continually made more and more into servants. Protect us from selfish interest, Jesus. Protect us from selfish ambition. Protect us from pursuing our own desires, Lord, to the exclusion of others. Help us to become people that serve. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, that's it for me, guys. Thanks so much. Pray you have a great week and uh, encourage you to make sure that every person in our church is finding a way to serve, uh, not just in church, but in, in all of their lives. And I'd encourage you to talk to your simple churches and your regional directors about that conversation, even as you now, many of you head into mealtime. Be blessed and have a great week.